Okay, good evening. Thanks for joining us again. Um, today, some actual painting. Um, I just had a call from Martin Darvel, who manages Yes, to say that the album I'm working on, the live album, was actually recorded at Las Vegas. And it seemed appropriate because the drive across the desert was very much an inspiration for this painting, although at the moment I'm thinking ice and snow more than desert, but um, I have been in that part of the world where ice and snow was the desert. Um, we stayed at the Hard Rock Casino, which reminded me I've been abusing BT, deservedly, but the Hard Rock Casino, the two we stayed in, were actually worse than BT. There was the first rooms we were in had no internet connection and I rang them up and I said um, do I need a special password and they said uh, no there's no internet connection in that room and I said ah oh, can I have a room with an internet connection the staff were wonderful everything else was a bit iffy when I got into my room we had a tabletop you know I'm working on a computer I'm doing drawing and sure enough there's a perfect table but right in the middle of it is a tray of stuff. It's not stuff I've ordered or stuff I want. An array of alcohol, um, nuts, all that kind of stuff. And all kinds of electronic gadgetry. So I do the natural thing. If it's covered in brochures, I pick them up tidily and put them in a drawer. But this was drinks and stuff as well as electronics. So I pick it up very carefully put it on the floor, out of the way, and get on with my work. When we get to leave, I hear a, a ruckus from the front desk as Michael is paying a bill, and he sort of comes at me angrily, how much alcohol did you have? What were you doing buying all that electronics? I said, I never touched a thing, I just put it on the floor. They said, well, it's all on the bill. And they have some kind of electronic detection to see if you touch any of their stuff and then it goes on your bill there's no debate you touched it it's on your bill so <laughs> Michael of course didn't pay for it and I didn't touch it any I didn't consume it I did touch it but it seemed a very predatory place not a very good place but the concert was blistering it was brilliant so I'm glad it's that concert that's on the album um, I'm just going to cut to the chase now and get on with the painting. Hang on, we've got someone saying they lost us and it's frozen. Um, if it's frozen, could someone let me know or if it's okay, just do a thumbs up or something. Sorry about this. How's that looking? Okay, so I try and turn this on, do I? It should be on. Okay, it looks like it's okay. No one's mentioned it. It might have been just a little blip. Okay, thank you, Dave. Okay, excellent. Okay, it looks like it's fine. Okay, Brilliant. when thank it's you. working, this little teeny D BT device is pretty good when it's working. It switches itself off. Okay. I imagine this painting as being a night sky and just painting it black but I, it's very boring painting the canvas white I had to put half a dozen coats of white on and it's going to be just as boring to paint it black so I've decided to give it a very early morning horizon line of light and paint it in a dark blue um, The kind of colours I would like to use are very hard to paint with. Um, ultramarine blue is fantastic colour, but because it's transparent, it's very difficult to put on smoothly with a brush. It's easy with an airbrush, but I prefer to do it all with, with a paintbrush. What I have here looks very murky. It's a mix of cadmium yellow white uh, light and grey, a sort of um, 
Ah, neutral grey number seven. And the reason for that is I want it to look yellow, but I want to turn down <coughs> the brightness of the yellow. By the way, one of the wonderful things about painting in acrylics is if I get it wrong, like I just did then, I can paint it out. It's not that easy with watercolour. I have to be much more careful. But just painting a line across the canvas. And by the way, I have a guideline. Sandy Riga asks, do you ever airbrush? I, I have an airbrush, which I used to use a lot more. I hardly ever use it now, but I do occasionally. Um, it's, I, it's, it takes a bit of patience to get a smooth gradation without an airbrush. But one of the things I found is that actually the eye is very forgiving. Um, a lot of uh, people have looked at gradations of mine and couldn't believe they're actually hand done until they go up close to the canvas and realize it's actually nowhere near as smooth as it gives the impression of being. You can see all the multiple brush strokes and different colors for that matter. I was just thinking it might be interesting to show what you do the guideline with. Because someone just asked if you draw a line in, and I know you mentioned that. But I have a remnant from my design I get it? Co college days, which is a T-square, which is a very quick and easy way to get a horizontal line. I don't need it to be horizontal, but it's a good start. Is that it? Mm. Is it clear? T-square. Could you just mention the Yes concert again? A couple of people missed that. Yeah, the Yes concert was the 26th of July in Las Vegas, last summer. So, I use a lot of plastic mugs and a lot of tissue when I'm painting. Do you use the same size canvases for all of your covers? Sorry, I missed the name if you asked that question. No. Um, most of my paintings are six foot by four foot, and I love the comfort of that size. It allows me to choreograph my movements in a very relaxed way. Um, this is smaller and tighter, um, but I felt I would like to do it this size. When I'm working on a big canvas, I tilt them towards me. But in this one, I'm letting it sit back. What time of day do you prefer to work? Are you a morning or an evening person? Ideally for me, um, when the world was doing its thing, I like to work in the morning. Um, I would like to get up at six, feed the cats, do some work, yeah, have breakfast, have a shower, but I like working in that hour or hours between say seven and nine, that's my best time. Um, by 10 or 11 the day is getting busy so I can't paint anymore. So it's early morning and evening for painting. Um, Jane Hall wants to know why do you tilt a big canvas forward? 
I do it because I like to keep my back as straight as I can when I'm painting. If I'm bending over it, I'm holding my body weight up and it's uncomfortable very quickly. So yeah, I like to tilt it. I'm so sorry, Dad. I hate to ask this. Is there any chance that you can talk and paint at the same time? <laughs> yes. Go for the questions. <laughs> okay. I just don't want to <laughs> disappoint one or other group. <laughs> um, again, sorry, I missed who asked this, but what audio books do you tend to listen to while you're working? What audio tapes? Mm. Bloody hell. Any. Any. Um... It's uh, quite different to my reading habits. My reading habits tend to be very much non-fiction. And my, the, the audio books I listen to tend to be, on the contrary, you know, detective stories, stuff like that. Something that really gets your attention. Um, and I can not need to pay too much attention. Uh, that sounds contradictory, but yeah. I like to be distracted when I'm painting. Sandy Regal, I think was her name, sorry, um, wanted to know if you had a favorite author. For listening to when I paint? Mm. Yeah, you know, the obvious ones, Stephen King, Joe Nesbo, um, yeah. I just, um, started listening to the new series of uh, Philip Pullman's book. I should have waited till they were all published because it's exasperating <laughs> ending halfway through the story, but yeah. So Brandon Burden wanted to ask, um, how many finished paintings do you plan on producing for this new Yes album? How many paintings? Mm. One. <laughs> well, maybe a couple of dozen sketches and m maybe a few um, watercolour sketches, but one finished painting. I can grab all my brushes because otherwise I'll be walking backwards and forwards. Do you thin the paint with anything other than water? I actually have a proper um, medium for diluting acrylic paint but I found water works and I, I stay with water as a habit. What did you think of that? This is my question. Uh, sorry guys. Um, what did you think of that Clarissa Pinkola Estes book, Mother Night? Did you listen to it? That what? Clarissa Pinkola Estes. Did you listen to it yet? No, I haven't. Yeah. From what I've read of it, I liked it. I, 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 that really, I would have said, is more the kind of book I would read than the kind of book I would listen to. Um, okay, I'm sorry if I pronounce your name wrong. Tabit uh, Alfalahi. Ah, sorry. Oh, I was reading your question. I was reading your name for so long, your question disappeared. <laughs> sorry, if you want to put that question in again, <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. I will read quicker. <laughs> This is hard. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I missed another one. Okay, let's see what I've noted. Is there a reason you don't use masking tape on the horizon? Um, actually, I, I, last week when I was working on the um, print, I put a, a strip of masking tape at the bottom of the Thing, so I wouldn't run paint into the white area. Excuse me, I'm going for more paint. Um, Tom wanted to know, I should stop firing quite so many at you. Maybe. No, go for it, go for it. Um, Tom wanted to know if um, or who of the Renaissance artists influence you. Who are the Renaissance artists? Anyone in particular, who, all of them, who everybody? Are, who asked that question? Someone called Tom. Okay. Um, Sorry, I missed your surname. I, 
I for the Renaissance of painters, Caravaggio, I guess. But what would you describe as Renaissance artists? Well, he put he put examples like Michelangelo and Da Vinci. Yeah, da Vinci a bit, um, Caravaggio. I. When it comes to the Renaissance, I think of it as very much um, an Italian experience. But and I like um, the architecture of the Gothic movement, not the sort of revival of classic architecture. So when it comes to architecture, I'm not hugely thrilled with the Renaissance. But it was kind of phenomenal from the freedom it gave artists. In a way, I'd argue that artists had more freedom to exchange ideas and experiment in those days than they do now. I think the art world is more conservative now than it was then. I'd really like to sort of be able to do a back and forth with questions that interrelate, but but they <laughs> but I am going to go with the ones that I've got because <laughs> particularly this one, you keep getting asked. Go with the ones you got. And this one is being asked by again. I'm sorry if I pronounce your name wrong. I think Chengiz um, wants to know: Do you like science fiction? Hmm. The simple answer to that is. In that I've read a lot of it, and I have enjoyed reading a lot of it, I always found science fiction surprisingly disappointing in the one area where I expected to be blown away. I thought it was not as imaginative as it should be. I always thought sometimes there were good stories, sometimes not so, but the views of the future, I felt were rarely engaging. I rarely came across a future where I thought, wow, this is it. This is the future I'm going to go to. Or I would want my family to go to. I, I never thought science fiction was great at getting a good inspirational take on a possible future. I'd say, there's your challenge for science fiction writers. Write a future that would be a good inspiration, a good role model for the future. But I enjoyed it in, as entertainment. <laughs> okay, we're getting lots of favourite questions, so I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a few of these. Um, I can answer those. <laughs> it changes every minute. What about movie? What about what? Movie. Your favourite movie. Favourite movie? Same answer, really. It changes by the minute. What um, have you liked recently? I liked um, a movie about bank robbers in Texas called Hell and High Water. <laughs> it's Jeff Bridges as the sheriff. I, thought I enjoyed that. It took me about four... Atlantic flights for, for me to get the whole movie awake, but it, yeah, I enjoyed that. I the, my f favorite movies, if I had to make a list of my 10 favorite movies, probably the top five would be uh, Kurosawa Samurai movies you know. um, Seven Samurai, Th Throne of Blood, Hidden Fortress. Not just Kurosawa though, there's a whole bunch that are fantastic. What about your favourite Amiga artwork? My favourite? Amiga artwork? For the games, did you not do Amiga? They probably mean Cygnosis. Um, well, I'll answer that question then. My favourite for Cygnosis. Uh, bloody hell. 
I like the logo I did for the company. Um, yeah, I like the logo I did for Cygnosis. Um, I was, I try to enjoy painting, you know, things like Shadow of the Beast. I did like doing Shadow of the Beast. Yeah, that was fun. Oh, I've just got an interesting question. I would like to get to Peter's question as he asked me what it's like having you as a dad. Um, I'm going to think about that while oh, we do. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Not fair. Can't be answered. I, I may put my answer in the comments later. Um, <laughs> no, it's lovely. It's very nice. Um, I'll think of a proper answer for later. Um, she tells the truth. But someone asked a good question that I want to know as well. At what point do you think of where you put the logo when you're working on the painting? I try not to relate it to the painting at all. For me, I always put, nearly always, I can't re readily think of examples where I didn't. I just put the logo top centre. Um, that way it doesn't look like it's part of the painting. It looks like it's part of the story, but not part of the painting. So yes, I don't make a space for the logo in the painting. The painting is standalone. It works in its own right. Sean wanted to know um, your opinions on Moebius. On what? Moebius. Is that Mobius. How you Mobius. Oh, fantastic. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, I never spoke to him because he didn't speak English and I didn't speak French. I spoke to him once via an interpreter um, who I think was his pal and his agent yeah I thought he was super clever a big loss he died what about Dali Ben wants to know your feelings on Dali um, when yes we're in Tampa um I crossed over and went to St. Petersburg in Florida to look at the Dali Museum, which was quite impressive. And um, Dali really could paint, amazing painting. And I saw uh, an exhibition there, not only of his work, but a, a later exhibition with um, his and Duchamp together. I don't think of myself as a surrealist painter. And I wouldn't want to be. Dali could paint them, whatever he was painting. Um, he was brilliant at I'm, yeah, yeah, amazing, amazing artist. Lots of people are asking, uh, what's your favorite piece of your own work? Oh, God. <laughs> This will be until I start the next one. Um, I do like Relaya, I like Badger, I like Pathways, I like Close to the Edge. Um, I have, a, you know, I love the paintings of the early years from when I started out, you know, things like Osabisa had an amazing impact on my career um, but I can paint much better now so uh, I'm always torn between paintings I love from that era but I wish I had the skill then that I have now so uh, I love the composition but the execution is early in my career so I guess it looks it too I got better doesn't mean I don't love them but it does mean I'm torn between the ones I love the execution of as much as I love the ideas which relates to Anders question which was how did you do this the backgrounds in your 70s paintings is it the same technique I guess is no. what he's asking no they, my, the paintings in the 70s were much more about drawings 
and then carefully painting around the drawings, filling in the colours, sometimes airbrushing, sometimes not, but nevertheless, you know, Osobisa was a watercolour wash, it wasn't um, airbrushed, but it nevertheless was primarily a drawing. Uh, Brandon wants to know if you're touring with Yes next year. We're all here, yes. <laughs> oh my dad. Yeah, I, I love touring. 19, oh sorry, 2019 was amazing fun. I expected it to be quite hard work and it turned out to be amazing fun. I loved it. And if, if they ask me again, I'll do it again, yeah. Um, Andy asks a good question, which I was wondering as well. Um, rectangular canvas, square album, question mark. Well observed. <laughs> I thought the question was going to be something quite different. I thought he was going to say rectangular canvas and round houses, but... Um, I paint the painting as I want to paint the painting and I use whatever of the painting I think appropriate for the cover so it's almost never the whole painting. Someone has observed, sorry Don Rogers has observed these are very tales of topographic oceans colours. Yeah, yeah. It's not a question, just an observation. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I missed who asked this question, um, but someone earlier asked, uh, how did you come up with the Yes Square logo? Well, it's an interesting question because I did get asked to do a new logo for Yes, not because Yes needed a new logo, but because in the inevitable and ever-changing lineups of Yes, there was a time when the band was not sure of its position of using the logo. And because they sorted that out before the album came out, I can't even remember which album it was. However, however, I like the square logo <laughs> so much, I did want to use it, and occasionally we've used it. But it's based on a Chinese chop yeah. Yeah. stamp, isn't it? It is, yeah. Um, Sandy wanted to know, are there any colours that you avoid? Um, yes, I, and I'm about to use them too. I tend to not use black. It's It's... It can do amazing things, but it's very difficult to keep disciplined. So, I should just qualify that and say it's very difficult for me to keep it disciplined. The colour I'm using, by the way, at the moment is pure, right out of the tube, and it's um, uh, Prussian blue. Um, oh, uh, a couple of people asking um, Geiger. What are your thoughts on Geiger? <laughs> well, my thoughts on Geiger. <laughs> well, once upon a time, we thought we would do a Geiger book, and um, I went with Al Mosley who was our publisher, partner in the publishing company, Dragon Stream. And um, I went to his house in Switzerland, which was amazing. But he wasn't there when we arrived. So his girlfriend was there. I say girlfriend, I don't really know their exact relationship. But um, he, he was out. And she gave us coffee. And... We sat there for an hour or two 
and the house was amazing it was like a kind of off-center Egyptian temple he had giant locust sarcophagi that were at least six foot tall wrapped around the room it was a fantastic experience actually I was fascinated to be there and when he came back he looked furious and he walked straight past us um, went to his girlfriend we looked at each other they left the room and we still sitting there looking bemused he came back and he stood between us and gave her a camera and then a great big smile he put his arms around us and she took a photograph of the us. <laughs> and then we talked um, huge talent huge huge talent and I have to be honest I couldn't live with his paintings on the wall uh, one of the very weird experiences from that day it was on the tail end of the Frankfurt book fair we, d we drove from Frankfurt to Switzerland and then we were driving back through France dropped Al off in Paris and my brother and I were driving and in the back of the car we had a set of prints that were to do with a magic ritual, a series, and they had an incredibly strong frankincense smell about them. And at that time, the French customs were doing a whole number. And we got stopped um, probably 40 miles from Calais, from Calais, which seemed a long way from the coast. Anyway, we had an English registration number, they waved us down. And uh, they wanted to see what we had in the book, in the back. And it was books. So they looked at the books, but they could smell this scent. And they came across this box, which was Geiger's Necronomicon limited edition print set. Signed, special edition. It was a lovely set with this incredible smell. And they thought they discovered a bunch of Satanists on the way to some evil doings and they got very excited about it and there was no way to calm them down they just thought they got the mother load there and I don't know how many hours later five or six hours later they eventually gave us everything back and we went, went on our way but um, yeah kind of fixed in my memory that, uh, that trip to Geiger I have his portfolio it's beautiful but I, I wouldn't put it up on the wall not because it's not brilliant, but just, just kind of disturbing. Okay. Well, Freya's just told me off, pausing. It's, um, I, I, this is a natural pause for me because it's going to take a few minutes for this to dry. And what will happen is when it's dry, I'll even out that coat. You can see how uneven it is. I'll smooth out that line, I'll soften the blends and it will start to look like what I want to look like. But this is basically it. I've got a question. So if someone said, why do you paint the edges? And my question is, why have you painted the edge with the dark blue and not the two other colours? Missed it. I'll go back and do it. I paint the edges because um, I don't always frame the canvases. Um, prints, watercolours, Things that have to be protected, I always frame because they need protection. But these are very robust and the paint is robust. You know, once it's, um, I, I, I've done appalling things and I wouldn't want anyone else to do it to my work. But um, we had an exhibition in the Isle of Man and the um, curator there was brilliant. And he studied every painting and he gave me a list of where on a painting it was spider poo or bird droppings. <laughs> I think, oh God. So, I, of course I had my paints. He told me to bring my paints. And, and I thought, I'm not going to paint over spider poo. I'm going to wash it off. So, spider uh, poo must be tinier than you can see, surely. It's not tinier than you can see, <laughs> but it is tiny. It's about the size of a pinhead. Depends what they've been eating, I guess. But they, they get on the paintings. But you can a warm cloth and you can and warm water you can wash them they are robust and 
these stretches are aluminium and wood, so they're very robust. But a watercolour, you touch it and you can mark it. And any damp thing will mark it. It is not robust. You do not want to be touching watercolours. And my watercolours are incredibly dense with colour. So they are the density makes them more susceptible. I'm going to pause on this and go and work on the print while I wait for this to dry. So we've got five minutes before we end at the usual time, but if you're just going to start something else, we can go on a bit longer. Okay, well, then for this session, I, I, I'm going to stop there. But I might just smooth it out a bit between now and next time we see. I, I just want to show you one thing, though. This is one of those times where I have to find it. Shall I ask you a question while you're looking? Go, go for it, Michael. Um, Jane wanted to know if there's any particular significance to the dragons and beetles. Which, which dragons and beetles? She didn't specify. Um, maybe, maybe the yes print set ones. Oh, the dragonflies. Dra what did I say? Dragonflies and beetles. Yeah. No, I just thought they were. I would do something that I thought was beautiful, and I did. <laughs> okay, if I want to put something on here that's very precise, I can do two things. I can t have a reference picture, and I can paint it. And that's what I usually do. But sometimes, if I want to get exactly the proportion of a sketch I've done, I'll grid it up like this. So this is a, a sketch that's gridded and I will look at the proportions and say okay if that goes here two and a half times that's a one inch grid I'll make a two and a half inch grid and I'll, I'll copy it much more accurately. Um, there's an even easier way which allows me to figure out exactly where it goes and I'll copy it onto a piece of paper and then I can adjust its position and juxtapose it with other elements of the painting. I don't normally paint that precisely. I can usually live with the inaccuracies of where I put things because it's of the moment and it works in the moment and I'm usually very happy with it. But if I'm not, it's always possible to change it and re redo it. So... Um, I guess I, there's not really a lot of time to go over to the prints, but I will do that next time while we're waiting to do the print drawing. So I'll leave the print for now. How are we doing on the questions? <laughs> Someone said if we both ask, he'll get the question. Uh, that's not how it works. I have to just coincidentally see it when I'm looking at the screen, but you are twice as likely to get your question asked if you both ask, whoever you both are. Um, for now, um, somebody asked, does anyone live in the homes that you designed? Sadly not, and hopefully that will change. It won't change this year, but the setting that ball in motion this year is possible. We should introduce you. Not today. Not today. <laughs> when I'm more glamorous. <laughs> when you're more glamorous. <laughs> what about when I'm more glamorous? We can't wait forever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm being tormented. I'm trying to find another question quickly. <laughs> uh, you see, the problem is a lot of people ask certain questions that I know they want the answer to, but I'm, I feel reticent about asking you in case it turns into something... Um, let me see. Okay, here's a nice one. <laughs> Doesn't have to be nice ones. Um, uh, okay, well, I'm going to ask the one that lots of people have been asking because I think a few people want to know. Um, what are your thoughts on Rodney Matthews? My thoughts on Rodney Matthews? He was an immensely competent artist, a really very clever and very competent artists. And there was a time in the 70s when 
I was very impatient with him because I thought he was following too closely in my footsteps. And that troubled me. And Peter Lederber, who was the publisher at Big O, said to me that um, I was too slow and he needed more prints. <laughs> and I thought that was not a good way to explain away what was going on. But he said Rodney was a very nice guy and I should meet him. I didn't want to know. I didn't want to go there. But in more recent years, I have met him. I did like him. Um, he does his, other th his own thing. He's very good at making his own worlds. So I think we have a friendly relationship now. I hope so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say went through some stressful times, but okay now. So you were also asked twice, and in this case it's worked. Uh, were you approached or did you audition to do the covers for Yes? I, <clears throat> I did the um, first album cover for Ronnie Scott because I was working at Ronnie Scott's doing the interior of the discotheque upstairs in Ronnie Scott's. And they looked at my sketchbook and they asked me if I'd do an album cover for a band called The Gun, which, by the way, John Anderson was briefly singer for and was considering using the band as his backing group. But by the time I met them, he, he was no longer with them. Um, I did a cover for them, which I'm very happy with. They, they had a hit single called Race With The Devil. But I then got to do a bunch of Ronnie Scott's jazz covers and I didn't like the graphic design constraints. They wanted them astonishingly conventional. Not Ronnie Scott, I should say, but the record companies. And it was hard for me to break out of that. And I thought, I love doing record covers, but I'm not doing any more of this. I'm not doing any more where I'm told what to do. So I went back to see David Howells, who'd left CBS and was now a and at MCA. And I said, I want, a, I want a lot more freedom than getting doing these jazz covers. Got any ideas? And he gave me, basically, the cover for Osabisa to do, which was a huge breakthrough for me because when I finished that, I saw it, there was a record store in Oxford Street that filled the window with it. And I mean, it wasn't a band that was selling that many at that time. It was an unknown band, relatively speaking. But that shop window full of full of the Osabisa cover kind of blew me away I, it was so exciting to see the work just filling up that space it wasn't a big poster it was hundreds and hundreds of record covers and that was amazing and I thought then I, I could do this and um, Big O Posters started doing my posters as a consequence and sold huge numbers and I took my very tiny portfolio, <laughs> one or two covers I was happy to show people, and started knocking on doors, you know, traipsing around the streets of London with a portfolio. And I met Phil Carson, who was boss of Atlantic in Europe. And he looked at my work. He was very kind. He said, I love your work, but I've only got two bands, Yes and Led Zeppelin. And he said, as soon as one need to cover I'll introduce you and he did and within a few weeks I he took me down to Advision where I met Yes so I was introduced to Yes by Phil Carson who was boss of Atlantic in Europe I still see him occasionally I, I still get on with him very nice guy we're getting lots of really good questions um, a couple of people mentioned Avatar again. I would refer you back to the previous video we did so we don't get into all of that again, particularly in the last minute. And as we are in the last minute, I think we should finish with a joke question. I assume it's a joke question. <laughs> um, Mike says, I love the vest you wear. Who's your favorite maker? The vest I wear? I beg your pardon, but this is a waistcoat. <laughs> a vest. <laughs> It's a sleeveless T-shirt. <laughs> Who are you wearing, Dad? That's the question. Well, this is an easy answer. 
Um, I bought it from. I bought one of these from a clothing shop in San Francisco, and they only had one, and it got very beaten up, and I could never find it again. So there was a, a tailor in Brighton who did costumes for theatre, and I asked him if he could replicate it, and he did, and he made me two, and then he couldn't get black, so he made me two in very dark blue, and then later he told me he had the black and he made two more in black. So they were not expensive, but they were handmade by a theatrical costume maker. So, Mike, I hope you're happy with that answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, sell them on, we sell them on the website. So go to the website. You might have to search for quite a few years to find the vest. <laughs> Hang in there. Oh, I've got to stop being mean to you publicly. Um, and yeah, we should wrap up. I hope you all heard that. Freya's going to stop being mean to me publicly. <laughs> Private's another matter, I guess. And you guys are asking loads of really good questions. I'm making notes of as many as I can, and maybe we'll start with them next time. And just to say again, it's Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 7 p.m., English summertime. Um, is that right? So what day is it today? Friday. So the next one's on Monday. Yep. What are you going to do? I'm going to at least get this well underway on Monday. We haven't started filming every brush stroke yet, but we're going to have that fixed up there and we're going to be doing that on Monday. So you can do catch up then. And yeah, this is one aspect of the painting and that will be in place ready to go on Monday and I'll start painting what people will recognize as painting i.e. making marks that have meanings <laughs> not just staining the canvas a, di a different color thank you all again for bearing with us with the Wi-Fi sound and vision issues and thank you all for thanking me too it <laughs> makes me want to do lots of them <laughs> longer <laughs> well, I want you to thank you very much thank you <laughs>